We're looking this week at the wise men. We could learn a lot from great men and women in history, and we're going to do that with the wise men today. We're going to take three quick lessons that we could learn from the wise men that we can take with us during this season. Sarah and I were over in, uh, in Niles, Ohio yesterday at the McKinley, um, uh, his birth home, and President William McKinley and a library there is beautiful memorial of him. Don't know much about him. Still don't maybe a whole lot about him. I know he was assassinated in Buffalo, New York. We knew that. We've been there, I think, to that location years ago. He taught in a one-room schoolhouse. How about that? $25 a month is what he made doing that. In the Civil War, he was known, he was known for some uh, disobeying orders. It was the Battle of Antietam, and it was bad. And the troops needed food and water, and he was over that. And they said, don't go. It's, you it can't risk it. And they were literally starving. And uh, uh, McKinley, being at the time not a very high-ranking officer, heard those orders and said, that's not going to happen. And so he gathered together and went right into the war with food. So in his political career, he was known as Coffee Bill. That was his slang forever was Coffee Bill because here it is in the fighting. A hero in his own way, in a unique way. I think there's a lot of great men and women in history we can learn from. The wise men are interesting. There is only one passage that speaks to them. It's this one passage that we read in Matthew. This is all we have on them. And the first thing I want to take note of for us is they relied on the Lord. The passage says, after listening to the king, they went on their way, and behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where Jesus was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly. They were very attentive to being open to the Lord. They were open to the Lord. They followed a star. I've talked to a lot of people who have an interesting dream and they want to know all about it because they want to be open to what God's wanting them to do or lead them. Maybe their alphabet cereal is going to spell something, so they'll stir it gently. How's God lead us? We're so wanting to be led and we want to be open to the Lord, so we read things. And a misunderstanding of this text would be that they followed a star, the circumstances that led them to Jesus, and we could then say the same thing. I'm going to follow things, and maybe it's a phone call that came at the right time, or maybe it's something coincidental that took place, or maybe it is a dream, or something happened, and I'm trying so much to be alert to the Lord. When we today understand that we are led by the Lord through His Word, Hebrews 1 says this, and you've got to get the context of timing. Hebrews 1 says, Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our forefathers and prophets. But in these last days, He's spoken to us by His Son. Yeah, you have a fascinating dream, and it could, it could be very fascinating what it means. It might mean that you had pizza the night before. Certainly, there's a really good chance of that. We're looking for messages from the Lord because we want to be open to Him. And yet, so often, we're skipping the message. It's right here. It's that you and I are open to the Lord as these wise men were open to the Lord, that we are open to Him through His Word. In the past, God spoke through dreams and visions. 
This is Hebrews chapter 1. But in these days, he's spoken to us through his word. Most of us agree with that, right? Pretty easy? Okay. Look at last week. Look at your last week. How much time listening and being open to the Lord through his word? We have a lot of messages being sent to us through television, radio, and friends, and podcasts, and scanning reels and videos. We have messages being sent to us constantly. And the majority of it is godless. It's without God. Most of it. Historically, newspapers have their largest department in a newspaper is sports. Hey, I'm all for it. I'm definitely all for the Steelers winning today. It's gonna, if there's ever a week it's going to happen, it's this week. Right? It's Cardinals, right? Yeah, yeah. So that's, that's going to be a win. We have messages coming to us all the time. We're reading things all the time. We're listening to things all the time. And they're not the things of God. Many of them are very necessary. So I'm not saying we can't do that because we need to keep up with the news. And you can watch your favorite show on Netflix and we can do all of these things. But we have to be so careful that like these wise men were so open to the Lord, are we living our days in such a way that are open to the Lord? Is it a five-minute reading in the morning as a formality because it's daily bread or something? It's very good. You read our chapter. And we close it, and it isn't 20 minutes later. I can't even tell you where I read. Right? Often? Some of you? Sometimes? Are we open to the Lord? What's very interesting about the Magi is they're usually celebrated, and again, some of you in the more formal churches, it's usually into January, there's some type of a message on the wise men. So we have the Christmas season, get into the new year, and we talk wise men sometime in January. That is because of the timing The wise men would not have been at the actual birth. It was a season later based on dedication of Jesus, purification of Mary. The very earliest would be 40 days after. Probably quite a bit longer, right? Because Herod wanted the kids two years and under killed because he was getting that time frame right. Could have been a year and a half, could have been a year, sometime later. That's why typically the wise men are talked about later. But the message of them, this being open to the Lord, is the fact that they were non-Jewish. This is incredible. They were non-Jewish. You take the word, and it's really tricky. The only text is right here that we read, that the Greer family read, and then that we're looking at in Matthew is the only text we have. They're referred to as wise men, or magus is one. Magi is more than one. King? Maybe? Very possible astrologer? Astrology is condemned in the Bible. Probably Persian. Be over in the area of Iran in Iraq today would have been the kingdom. It's probably where they came from. God sent message to them about the birth. That's a beautiful picture of the love of God. You feel like you don't belong. You feel like you don't deserve. He went out of his way. 
to make sure this isn't just, it's all been about the preserving the line of Jesus with the Jewish people. It's all about the Jewish people and yet opened up in the center of the story and being open to the Lord are these two, three, maybe more, magus, magi, non-Jewish. It's beautiful. Look at the reverence that they showed. Verse 11. This is Matthew 2. It's verse 11. They came into the house. That also gives the idea that it was probably later. That's an interesting word because it is actually house. They saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. And when they'd opened their treasures, they presented gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. They fell down and worshipped. Now, it was as early as Tertullian. This was an early church father who decided that there were three of these wise men, and that is simply because of the three gifts. Just, he just took a leap there and said, three gifts, three wise men. Been awkward to be the fourth guy, right? He goes, I, think, I don't have anything. I just, I barely packed a lunch. I mean, I had no idea we were coming. So was it three gifts for the, the three of them? Yeah, maybe so. But it was actually after that, and this was hundreds of years later, they actually named them. Did you know that? That um, church history, quote unquote, whatever that means church history, has names for them. It's Melchior, Balthasar, and Gaspar are the name of the three wise men. It'd be Gaspar the friendly wise men, I think is what that, it would have to be. I mean, that's, that would only make sense. If these three, they show up with gifts And they're carefully chosen gifts. There's value in these gifts. This is what we lose very quickly is this reverence coming before the Lord. I know what you'd say is if he were actually sitting here, if it were literally baby Jesus right here, I would have more of a reverence about myself. I don't know. I don't know about that. We've made that argument for a long time. If I could just see him do a miracle, if he could walk in and do a miracle, I would believe. Well, 2,000 years ago says that's not true. People saw the miracles. They saw him interact, and they chose to not believe. The problem with reverence and belief is not the outside, it's the inside. How do we come in gathering as a church family without reverence? Well, it's easy. It's easy. We show up. We show up, it's another Sunday. We could be critical. We could be judgmental of each other, even in here. How do we lose that? Because these three went a long, long ways and didn't exactly know where they were going. So they actually stopped at the king. King Herod and asked, where is this guy? Like, I know he's here. We're not giving up. This has been a long road, and we're going to stay with this. And they come with a reverence. They fell down, and they worshiped, and they opened their treasures. Message all on its own is right here. For us, for Sarah and I, do we give financially supporting the church, and then financially in just helping people. Do I ever give where I really feel it and it hurts, or do I give out of the abundance and I don't miss it? That's a very painful question. Because we're to give sacrificially. 
but we have an abundance, and so we're like, yeah, I've budgeted for it, so I can do this, and it doesn't hurt. Same with time. A volunteer. Maybe you volunteer for a sports team at school, or you're volunteering for an organization somewhere, and yeah, unless something comes up. So the commitment is only so far. I'm challenged by these three as we look at some great people. I'm challenged by the fact of the reverence. Worshiping submission. Do we open our Bible in the morning and just say, yeah, 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 okay, got it. I'm reading. I, I got things to do. I'm kind of busy. But yeah, good truth. I, I, like, the, I like that. I'm gonna, I got it, and off we go. And I could just imagine, and I, I'm not, I'm making this up, that the Lord goes, okay, just go. You, you, you're just, just go. You're obviously in a hurry. There's obviously some formality going here. I'm good without it. Not interested in the formality. I want you. Relax. Sit here a minute. And go, oh, okay. I gotta go, I gotta go. He goes, yeah, seriously. Go. You're worried about your day. Go do it. Or leave it here with me and relax. It's one of the greatest passages in the Bible. Mary and Martha, they're serving Jesus. And literally said to Martha, you are worried and upset about many things. But only one thing is needed. And Mary has chosen what's best. Because Mary sat quietly listening to Jesus. Martha was preparing food and preparing things. You are worried and upset about many things. There's only one thing that's needed. What, one of many things that are needed. There's a top ten things that are needed. Nope. There's only one thing that's needed. And Mary has chosen what's best. And it will not be taken away from her. So tomorrow morning, that's our choice. We're open to the Lord through His Word, but then it's also a reverence. And we literally will know it tomorrow morning. We'll know when we're sitting quickly and our Bible's open and we're just like, I, oh, I'm late. I just got to quick go. I got to read this really fast. Yeah, and there's probably value in that because you grab some interesting things and maybe a little bit of head knowledge. There's nothing wrong with that, I guess, unless we think that's actually showing some reverence to the Lord. Like, do we know who we're talking to? Do you have any idea who you're sitting with? Relax. Yeah, but I have so much to do today. I know you do, which is why sit, slow down, get centered, relax, and just worship Him. What are you asking for? Nothing. I'm giving Him. It's my day. Will my car start? Will I make it there on time? Will the appointments show up? Will I make money at that sales thing? I have no idea. Will I win? I don't know. I don't know any of that. But we sit there quietly in reverence to the Lord because we say, because none of that matters as long as I'm with you. That's all I care about. So it's open to the Lord. Showing a reverence to the Lord. Because after they fell down and worshipped, also gave treasures, the gold, frankincense, and myrrh. I think we could probably tell a lot about um, somebody based on what we give them. So like, guys, let me give you some tips for Christmas. Don't buy the woman of your life like cleaning supplies for Christmas. 
you're right? Or cooking lessons. Oh, yeah, try to do that with a straight face. Honey, I got you cooking lessons. And it says on it, uh, last couple years, good try. Um, we bought Grant one year, a stuffed animal. It was a, a, a bed mite. You know, have you ever seen what a bed mite looks like? Like they're microscopic? Well, you can get them in a stuffed animal. That, that really is very comforting, holding one of those things. Knowing that there's millions of them in your pillow, that's really good to know as well. And so, you know, if you give your best friend a tin of mints, might be a message there. If not, it's the toothbrush and toothpaste that went with it might have been. What we give has message. And in a reverence to the Lord, what we give reveals, it's like we could trick ourselves, it actually reveals our heart. So I encourage, sit with a piece of paper and a pencil and just think for a moment, what do I give the Lord? What do I give Him? That's, that's not easy. Maybe sit with somebody and talk that through. What do I give Him? Sit with somebody that you don't mind them actually seeing numbers. Not just money numbers, but time allotment. And you go, oh, I do a lot of it, but I wonder if I do a lot of that just for myself. Great question. Find back into the heart of it. Why are you spending time there? You got caught up and now you're doing it for them. Oh, don't do ministry just for the people. They'll, they don't appreciate too often. Right? Who usually turns on you? The one you've helped the most. Am I right? In life, I'm not doing it for them. I'm doing it for Him. Money, time, resource. Take a look at this last one. It's relying on the Lord. They gave us a good model for relying. It says in verse 12 in Matthew 2, and being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. So they relied on the Lord to protect them on this journey. I just wrote these phrases down. Listen to these maybe. Um, they didn't know how long the journey would be. There's no evidence they had any idea. All they knew, they were following the star. I don't know how they knew to pack. They didn't know what they would encounter on the way. They didn't really quite even know what they were going to find when they reached their destination. Many of you have no idea what next year is going to hold for you. Some of you are facing some health concerns that are really, really starting to concern you. And you're like, I barely made it out of this year. I don't know what next year is going to be. Or we're going into next year without somebody who means a lot to you. There's some uncertainty. Could be financial. You literally don't know how you're going to make it through another year, you're going to have to make some big decisions. This is it. This is what they had. They don't know what the journey is going to hold for them. But what we'll do is we're looking so far out at all of these uncertain things and we're overwhelmed by the uncertain things that we're skipping those things in front of us that we know we should be doing. We're always asking God to reveal some secret knowledge of what's going to happen with. How is that going to work out? And we're frustrated because he's not telling us. Because what he's saying is, I've got that. You know what you're supposed to do today and you're not doing it. Oh, yeah, I know I've got sin in my life. It's this... Yeah, it, it's under control. Call that sin management. It's not what we've been called to do. So there's a known sin in our life, and yet we're asking God to reveal things in the future that are bothering us. 
And he goes, no, I have another idea. How about if you take care of those few things in front of you that you know that you need to be taken care of, and I have the rest? And we go, I don't like the deal. Just tell me. I started riding motorcycles when we moved up outside of Sedona, Arizona. We moved north above Phoenix about an hour and a half, and it's beautiful up there. If you've been that way, you know that area really well. Um, There's this route going through Sedona, then up into Flagstaff, and I'm like, this is made for a uh, Harley Davidson if I've ever seen. So Sarah and I would take trips up to Jerome, Jerome is outside of our little town, up on the side of the mountain, and it's, a, it's an old mining town, and we'd ride on the motorcycle up, and we'd get dinner, and you can oversee all of um, uh, Cottonwood and Clarkdale and Sedona, and you can see the peaks in Flagstaff, which are 80 miles away. It's just gorgeous. But my bike had a weird thing about it. And I, I could have fixed it if I had any ability at all with a wrench. I'll barely recognize a wrench if it were sitting in front of me. Well, the headlight, it wasn't just that it was turned down. There's something else going on where I literally could only see like 30 feet in front of me. So whenever I rode with somebody at night, they always knew to go in front of me. So I can see a little bit more, right? That's only made sense. That's how I fixed it. So, so we're, we're riding, and it's just very typical. So Sarah and I are cruising up there at dinner, coming back, and I'm going pretty slow because I literally can only see like 30 feet in front. So we just went slow like an old man. That's what Harleys are for anyway. So I'm just cruising on this really slow, but I've got a five, six-mile ride home that I have no idea what's out there. All I know is it's right here, and it's all you need to know. Just slow down, pace yourself, and you need to do this right. And then it goes up to there, and then it goes further, and then it goes further. He's going to worry about the big picture. That's just the way life is. You only see so far ahead of you. And the truth is, you and I aren't even that clear on what's immediately in front of us. For anyone in this room that has received a phone call out of nowhere of the loss of somebody or a health concern, a trip to the hospital, you've lost all of your money, they're suing you for the... If you've ever received that phone call, you realize you don't actually even see that much. We act like we do. How did they do that? How did they travel that kind of distance with only a few pieces of information and they faithfully pulled it off, pivoting like a dream saying, I wouldn't go back to him. Really? Uh Uh-uh. A different way. Really? I can't just backtrack? Like, I got to go now a different way? No complaint. Another little project for us, maybe it would be good to sit and say, what does God want me to do? The things that we're skipping, the things we want to know the big picture, we want to know later on what's he want from me, what's he have in store for me later. Let's let that sit for a minute. What does he want from me today? Why do I come in here? Why, why am I here? What am I doing? How did I start another day of my life as a believer in Jesus Christ? How did I start another day neglecting the clarity of his word in my heart and mind? How did I do that? It's a fair question. Because the more we do that, the more we're being consumed by the unknown of which God will not reveal to us. The uncertainty, the discomfort. I don't know why God took that person from you. I have no idea. And you know what? You'll never know either. You're just not going to know. 
you'll come up with a couple things that are interesting. Oh, I bet it was for this. Sure. That makes you feel better? Fine. No. Because God loves you with an everlasting love. He does things in our lives that we may never know until we see him. It's just the way it is. So we put our head back down and rather get the anxiety of the uncertainty ahead of us, we put our head down and say, God, this is what I do know. I love you. And I trust you. I'm hurting right now. I would do anything to get this person back or to get this marriage back together or this family. I would do anything for my kid to be able to do this, which he's never going to be able to do. Whatever it is, God, all of that's true. But you know what? I trust you. I gave you a lot of projects here, a lot of lists that you can come up with. Are you open to the Lord? That means open in the right place. Are you looking in the right place? And are you open to what he has for you? The second one is, are you showing reverence to the Lord? Are you in the motion so you kind of lost the reverence? Maybe renew that a little bit. And are you relying on the Lord for every day that lighted path in front of you or are you relying on him? Heavenly Father, these guys, however many there were and whatever their names were, they've left us some pretty good lessons. And I would ask that your Holy Spirit would move some of us to some actions, some decisions, maybe best some conversations with people to decide where to go, what to do, in light of these great lessons from the wise men. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Why don't you stand with me?